Gail, and I'm here to read today. And what I've found out over my life is you really only need to know one thing in life, and that is how to read. Because once you can read, you can learn absolutely anything you want. Just open a book, open the computer, do some research, and you can learn to your heart's content. So today, I'm going to start and I'm going to read you some stories from the St. Andrew's book, Beyond the Gates of Lower Fort Gary. And this is the first edition, so many of you will not have seen it. St. Andrew's Fire Department. Firefighting in St. Andrews was no different than in other areas in the early years. The method of fighting fires was with pails of water, rakes, shovels, potato or grain sacks, blankets or clothing even. Communication was by word of mouth, church bells or anything that would draw attention. Residents would notice flames and smoke and rush to offer their help. Grass, bush, and marsh fires were fought in the same manner. When telephones came into use, neighbors, stores, gathering places, the municipal hall and garage were called for their assistance. The secretary, treasurer, and municipal employees were actually their first fire department. Can you imagine? Backpacks were purchased as our first equipment. When a call was received in the municipal office, Jim Oakes, secretary treasurer at the time, would call the municipal garage and dispatch the men to the fire. Method of transportation was an old half ton truck. We could say that our first fire chief was Jim Oakes and firemen were Sandy Gunn, Don Couture, Ken McLaughlin, Bill Kirkness, Bob Schindler, and many others. The municipality purchased two cylinder type tanks on wheels. It took four to six men to load these units on the half ton truck, along with backpacks, and then off to the fire they'd go. The first major fire to be fought with this equipment was the Clan de Boy elevator. The elevator was saved that time. Our first truck purchase was a 1956 used GMC Army truck with a tank capacity of 1,600 gallons of water. It had six-wheel drive, portable pumps, and maximum speed was 50 miles per hour. Wow! This truck was used until the late 1970s. Because of its six-wheel drive, it was ideal for access to fields, marsh areas, and snow-covered roads. This truck was stationed in Clandeboy in what is known as Fire Hall Number 1. In 1974, another used truck was purchased from the Beausager area. It was a cab over international tanker. As the municipality grew, the need for additional equipment increased. A used fire pumper Diamond T was purchased from the city of Winnipeg. Capacity was 300 gallons. It was complete with power, train, drive, and could handle one and a half inch to two and a half inch hoses. So about this big around, later the tank capacity was increased to 600 gallons. Growth at the south end of our municipality made it a necessity for us to move some equipment closer to that area. A decision was made to move the pumper Diamond T closer to St. Andrews. Space was rented from Thiel Masonary in Selkirk. If a fire started in the south area, a truck from Clandeboy and our truck in Selkirk would be dispatched. 
By this time, better communication was needed. A private telephone line was made available to us with extensions to Edwin Carter's, Alexander's store, Jim Oakes's home, and the municipal office. Mrs. Jean Carter became the operator and dispatcher of all fire calls, which is still in effect to this day. Growth in the north part of the municipality made us aware of the need for a fire truck to protect that area. A 1975 used GMC tanker was purchased. It had a capacity of 1,500 gallons. Stainless steel tank, portable pump, and was placed in Ford Drilling's garage. The availability of water was there and quick access to highways made it an ideal area to house our fire truck. In 1974, a new Seagraves fire pumper was purchased, complete with power drive pump, capacity was 800 gallons, and there were connections for one and a half inch to two and a half inch hoses. This truck was stationed in number one fire hall in Clandeboy. The Seagrave answers to all calls north and south. In 1977, our first well was drilled at the number one fire hall. Previous to this, water was obtained from ditches, sloughs, creeks, the river, the steam plant in Selkirk or any other place where water was available. Council, in their wisdom, could foresee the rapid growth that would take place south of Selkirk. In 1975, a new fire hall was built just off St. Andrew's Road. The hall is a large two-bay building complete with a six-inch well, washrooms, and meeting area. The Diamond T Pumper was moved from Selkirk to Number Two Hall. In 1979, a new truck was purchased, an International. A 1,600-gallon metal tank was installed with a portable water pump. This was then moved to the South, Number Two Hall, because of the increased population in that area. A used Eaton's van, was purchased and used for equipment at the number two fire hall. The south end of the municipality was now had complete protection. It was now time to retire our first truck. Parts for the old C GMC army truck were not available and the truck was always in need of some repair. Maximum speed was 20 miles per hour, not quite suitable for a quick response. This left number one fire hall in Clandeboy with only one truck. In 1980, a new international truck was purchased, a water tank of 2,000, wow, gallon capacity was installed along with a portable pump. Communications always have to be updated. Two-way radio units were purchased for each hall. These units were installed in each pumper only. This way they could communicate with the dispatcher, each pumper unit and the public works department of the municipality. To further our efficiency, pocket beepers were rented on a trial basis. When a fire call came in, the dispatcher would dial the beep, beeper number which would alert the firemen who would call in to find the location of the fire. This system, although a great improvement, left too much room for errors and delay. At this time, we are awaiting delivery of pager systems for every fireman. One call from our dispatcher alerts and gives locations of the fire. It is our intention to keep abreast of new communication systems available. A minute saved could mean saving a human life, cattle, 
or buildings. The need for our own premises was felt in the north part of the municipality. A new 30 by 50 metal insulated building has been erected in the Matlock area adjacent to the Matlock Community Hall. The building is complete with a six inch well, washrooms and a meeting area. Although it will house only one fire truck at present, there is room for another two fire trucks. Occupancy took place on January 1st, 1982. Portable holding tanks have been purchased for the number one and number two fire halls. This enables us to have a supply of water while the tankers go for refills. The following information will, would give you an idea of our water capacity. At number one fire hall, they have a pumper with 800 gallons, a tanker with 2,000, and two portable tanks with 1,000 gallons each. At number two fire hall in St. Andrews, they have a pumper with 600 gallons, a tanker with 1,600 gallons, and two portable tanks with 1,000 gallons each. And at number three fire hall in the Matlock area, they have a tanker with 1,500 gallons, one portable tank with 1,000 gallons. So in each of these areas, they have different amounts of water based on what they figure they would need to fight with, which is very important. And if you're not sure what a gallon is, you'll have to have your teacher explain the difference between a gallon and a liter. And that can be part of math as well. For the present, we find that the residents of St. Andrews Municipality should feel fire safe within our boundaries with adequate water supply and capacity in all areas. Two years ago, through the Fire Commission's department, a mutual aid system of all fire departments was formed. This would enable a fire department in need of help to call the area coordinator to dispatch neighboring departments to assist in major emergencies. The St. Andrews Fire Department is part of the Interlake Mutual Aid District. Assistance could be obtained from West St. Paul, St. Clements, Selkirk, Rosser, Toulon, Stonewall, Winnipeg Beach, and the Interlake Hutterite Colony. Our services are also reciprocal to these areas, meaning that they will give back if there's a fire in one of those areas. The Rural Municipality of St. Andrews Council is very proud of its fire department. Along with its equipment, we boast of 40 good, experienced, volunteer fire people. And then they go through the list of the leadership. So they have Mrs. Jean Carter as the coordinator and dispatcher, Mr. Edwin Carter as the fire chief at the number one hall, Mr. Reg Haddad at, as deputy chief at number one hall, Mr. Ron Truthwaite, as captain at number two hall. Mr. Tony Par Paradoski is the lieutenant at number two hall. Mr. Ron Lucishin is captain at number three hall. And Mr. Don Skorpatsky is lieutenant at number three hall. And please forgive me if I've said those names wrong. Maybe some of you recognize some of those names or you're related to some of them. They have meetings and they do training. The number two fire hall, um, there's a little bit written up about this and the volunteer firefighters, the fire number two, a fire hall number two, sorry, on Riverview Avenue in St. Andrews serves a busy and well-populated area of the municipality. The fire station is situated in an area where homes continually pop up in new subdivisions south of the town of Selkirk. 
The 11 men and one woman, Marge Paradowski, also protect one of the busiest airports in Canada, as well as industry, schools, and historic landmarks. Have any of you heard of Mar Marge Paradowski? She has a significant role in the RM of St. Andrews, and you could learn about her at St. Andrews Rectory if you wanted to. In the end of the RM of St. Andrews is the St. Andrews Airport, where private planes, flying clubs and schools, and aircraft-related light industry are based. There is also a float plane base on the Red River. Mandak Industries, the U Union Carbide Plant and part of the Selkirk Rolling Mills is in the RM of St. Andrews, not in Selkirk, and so under, are under the protection of Fire uh, Hall Number 2. Hundreds of children attend three schools, Mapleton, St. Andrews, and the new Lockport School in the area. Also important in the district are the historical buildings in St. Andrews, built when the area was a vital social and cultural base in Manitoba before the turn of the century. Personnel from the fire hall attend car fires and accidents, especially likely to happen on the busy number eight and number nine highways running between Winnipeg and the Interlake. Fire Hall number two holds three vehicles, a pumper, a tanker, and an equipment truck. In a short time, the pumper will be two-way radio equipped for a communications link with the fire hall. Water is pumped into the trucks from a well at the station. Before water had to be picked up, at any slough that could be reached easily. There is also a portable canvas tank that can hold a thousand gallons more, allowing the tanker to pick up more water while ensuring a good supply at the fire site. With the trucks, the pumper holds water too, and portable tank, Captain Frank Farsese of number two station has three 1,500 gallons available at any one time. Emergency calls go directly to the number one station in Clandeboy, where the chief of the department, Edwin Carter, is based. From there, calls are put out to the volunteer firefighters in the emergency area. A third station for the municipality is situated in Matlock, in total, the St. Andrews municipality has 30 to 40 volunteers to call on at any one time. Chairman of the Fire and Police Protection Committee for the RM of St. Andrews, Curly Gagnon, said their fire department also has an agreement with the surrounding municipalities if few, for, further help is needed in a fire. They would not come unless they are called by the department here, he said. The agreement extends to the town of Selkirk, the RMs of St. Clements, Rockwood, St. Paul, and an interlake Hutterite colony that has its own firefighting equipment. In between calls, Mr. Gagnon inspects each fire hall in the municipality some 15 to 20 times a year. They are surprise inspections, he said, where he makes sure the trucks are in running order and the equipment is ready for action. Now I'm going to read a little poem that's in here, and I think some of you may really enjoy this. Fire trucks are red because, fire trucks are red because truckers are dancers. Dancers are couples. Couples are joined together in matrimony, which makes them a groom and a bride. The bride has a train which runs on tracks. Tracks run into yards and two yards make a fathom. If you can't fathom the question, you pay a forfeit. A cat has four feet, which makes four rulers. Of course, we only have two rulers and one of them is Elizabeth, 
Queen Elizabeth is a boat which goes on top of the water. Now you know that water has waves which make it rough. Roughage is what cattle gets heavy on for the scales which grow on fish. Fish have fins too and you know the fins fought the Russians. Now fire trucks are always Russian and Russians are red. So like I told you, fire trucks are always red. And that's the end of the story on the fire trucks and the fire department in St. Andrews. So next time you see a fire truck racing down the highway, make sure you pull over to the side and wait for them to go past because they're going to save someone's building, someone's home, or someone's life. I'm going to read next on school days. Now all of you are in school, or I think you are, and you have different subjects and different things that you take perhaps and what they did back then. But the idea is that you go to a building, you have teachers, and as students you learn. So school days at Cloverdale in the late teens and twenties. Now that is 1919 and 1920, not 2019 and 2020. So a hundred years ago, yes, there was a school a hundred years ago. 1919, I will call that the crow egg year. As for some reason, there was a drive on that summer to destroy all the crows and gophers in Manitoba. I don't know if all schools took part in it or not, but Cloverdale School did. The teacher at that time was Miss Cornish. She told us we would receive five cents for each crow egg we brought in and five cents for a pair of crow's feet. Also, five cents for a gopher tail. That amount of money looked pretty enticing to a boy going to school in those days. Most of us went to work hunting down all the crow's nests and gophers we could find. Many gophers were caught by drowning them out of their burrows. With the help of the family dog, very few got away. Some were minus their tail. It ended up at the school the following Monday morning. Crows that had met with an accident were usually discovered by roving boys who were not above cutting their feet off and taking them to school. Some of those feet, tail, and eggs were starting to smell pretty high by the time they reached the school. I don't know how Miss Cornish, who was such a wonderful person, stood it all in those two months that the hunt was on. I do know we appreciated getting all that money. There are things that happened at school you never forget. And I'm sure you think of that now. A short while before school ended in 1919 for holidays, I tripped and fell on a plank while running to the school when the bell rang. My hand slid on the wooden plank and I must have gotten a half a dozen slivers in it. Although it felt like hundreds, I was in a bad way. And being a boy, I was not about to let on to anyone that I was in distress. When I got to my desk, I started digging at the slivers with an old safety pin. However, Miss Cornish's eyes saw that something was wrong, so she called me to her desk. I thought, oh boy, am I ever in for it now. She took one look at that hand and the always kind person that she was she went to work on my hand so gently. Before long, she had all those slivers out. She gave that hand a little pat and sent me back to my desk, a much relieved and happy boy. 
she had made a friend for life as I was so grateful. She left at the end of the term and I never saw her again. We had a teacher that was really a tyrant, strict, mean with capital letters, would be more to the point. She would club you anytime, anywhere, with anything she happened to have in her hand if you displeased her. School started the last two weeks in August, and fortunately, she only stayed then till Christmas time. By that time, she had browbeaten all the kids in school, girls and boys alike. She had no favorites, and she also had no friends either after the first week. We were so glad to see her go. However, most teachers we had in our time were all wonderful people, some more than others, but that, but not that old gal. The schoolroom was the last place she should have ever been. We had another teacher by the name of Mr. Peter Lewitt. He taught school from January until June, 1920. I know there are some in this day and age of strikes, study sessions, and fringe benefits that will find this hard to believe. Mr. Lewitt lived in Selkirk and he walked to and from Cloverdale morning and night all that winter. The only time he stayed over was when there was a bad storm on. I do not remember him ever missing a day all that term. In the spring, he bought a new Ford touring car, which was really a luxury at that period. He then found time to play football, soccer, as it is called today, with the boys, and he was out there almost every day. He played hard and enjoyed it as much as we did. We were all sorry when he didn't come back for the next term. There used to be a company in Toronto that had an offer every spring to sell garden seed. For quite a large number of seeds sold, we would receive a baseball, a bat, a catcher's mitt, and a fielder's glove. I believe the name was the gold medal people. The idea of that beautiful baseball equipment got us boys at school, so we decided we would send for the seeds to sell. They soon arrived and we were in business, but they didn't sell so well. The problem being that seeds produced in Ontario don't always do so well in Manitoba. Our parents, after much wheedling and coaxing on our part, bought the seeds. I am not sure whether they grew or not, but some must have. The money we received was mailed to Toronto and the great day when our equipment would arrive was anxiously awaited. Finally, it came. So another boy named John and I got permission from the teacher to walk to the post office and bring back the prized parcels as we believed there would be two parcels. Our spirits fell somewhat when we saw the one small parcel. We could hardly wait to get outside to open it and open it we did. Then our enthusiasm took a nosedive. Oh, when we saw what was inside, the remark my partner made when he saw the catcher's mitt wasn't of the best English language, so we can't repeat it. He gave it a kick that sent it flying. Boys just starting to play baseball use larger mitts than the size of the one we received. The baseball was filled with sawdust and lasted about three belts the next morning at recess. The bat lasted a little longer. The glove and mitt fared some better and they were around for a few weeks. Such was our adventure into salesmanship. <laughs> Have some of you tried something like that? 
the Christmas concert. Now, even at schools nowadays, we have a Christmas concert and moms and dads and your grandparents and neighbors all come to see you and they did in those days too. So the Christmas concert in our younger days at school, the most important event of the year was the Christmas tree as it was called. We looked forward to that from year to year. About the latter end of November, the teacher would start working on the Christmas concert. There would be several plays and in between there would be some songs and recitations. She did a marvelous job in getting shy little girls and sometimes stubborn little boys to play their parts so well. Some of the plays were long and she always seemed to be able to pick the right girl or boy for a particular character. The end was, result was that after about four weeks, she would have a group of girls and boys who were all eager to go out to put on a show that would please their teacher and their parents. The concert would be the talk of the neighborhood until Christmas Day, and sometimes even after that. The Christmas tree was sometimes, was something else again. It was a large spruce tree cut and hauled from what was called the Pines, now part of Birds Hill Park, the day before the concert. It stood about 12 feet tall and it was beautiful and always reached the ceiling. Electric power had not yet reached Cloverdale. So we would clamp dozens of candles all over it and light them up. That's right, live candles on a tree. Every child received a present and most of the smaller sized gifts were just set on the branches of the tree. The bigger gifts were just set on the floor. The tree looked so pretty with the candles all lit and presents around it. Then Santa Claus would appear ringing his bells and soon he would be handing out the presents also candy and apples. Everybody would go home tired but very happy. The teacher would know that all her hard work and effort was worthwhile. Looking back now, I often think of all those candles burning on that tree and the school packed with children and their parents. The thought scares me today However, the frost was still in the tree, so I suppose there was little danger of it catching fire. The next one I'm going to read is about this place right here. The Miss Davis School in St. Andrews. In the middle years of the last century, St. Andrews Rapids, the name used before the locks changed the river, was a social center. Retired Hudson Bay men with large families lived there and were feeling the need of a school, which they were quite prepared to support, to support financially. At that time, George Davis was officer in charge of York Factory. He sent his daughter Matilda to England so that she might receive a good education. Upon her return to Fort Garry, she became governess to the children of Chief Factor Swanson. When these children grew past the age of needing a governess, the residents asked her to open a school for 40 boarders. 
A site for it was chosen about a mile south of the fort. Work was started on this stone house. Stone for building was quarried from the bed of the river where, when it was at low season. The glass and hardware were brought from England on the yearly ship of the Hudson's Bay Company. All this took time and the school was open temporarily at Fort Gary. In 1858, the stone house named Oakfield was ready and was opened as a school. Miss Davis taught French and Mrs. Kennedy was able to give advanced instruction in music. The girls had good plain food with few thrill, frills of any kind. Their usual breakfast was potatoes mashed with milk, bread and butter, and tea, but no sugar. On Sundays, they walked two by two to St. Andrew's Church. In 1873, Miss Davis died. Mrs. Cowley, wife of Archdeacon Cowley, finished the term. The school was then moved to St. Andrew's Parsonage. Bishop McCrae made it a um, diocesan institution and Rupert's Land College on Carlton Street in Winnipeg became its lineal descendant. It is now Balmoral Hall. Have any of you heard of it? The stone house over the years was sold to a series of owners. One of these bought it with the intention of wrecking it and using the stone to build another house. He met with so much opposition to this from the old timers that he gave up the idea and renovated the old stone house. So that's it on that. Let's move to another school. Mapleton School. Number five, it was called Mapleton School number five. Now, when I was a little girl, and believe it or not, I was at one time five, six years old, I started school in a one room schoolhouse. And there was myself and one neighbor's child that were in grade one together. We were the only grade ones in the whole entire school. And there were no grade twos, and there were two grade threes, my older sister and the neighbor's older girl. So this is a story about a one-room schoolhouse. A long time ago, a little one-room school sprang up in the village of Old England. Oh. To be exact, in the year 1912. The memories of bygone days are nostalgic. Oh, if we could only live over those carefree days. Yes, there was hard work, heartaches, but the down-to-earth living will never be taught again. We were given the sense of security and good Christian moral responsibility to friends, neighbors, relatives, and our fellow men in our dear little schoolhouse. Our fall, fall term usually began the last week in August. Our parents worked hard to give us new clothes to start with, usually homemade, and sold a heifer or sold extra eggs, anything to get us our school books. I remember my sister went out and played the piano for a dance and gave mum the money so we could get our supplies. The new European settlers from out back, as we used to say, were brought to school by their parents in horse and wagon and in winter by horse and wagon box. Our caretaker would be busy trying to stoke up the furnace and fill the water fountain before school began. Our teacher had worked the day before getting the work outlined on the blackboard for grades two to eight. The grade ones were tutored personally. He rang the bell and we would line up outside, rain or snow or whatever the day would be like and march into our class. We would then 
sing O Canada or the Maple Leaf Forever and then recite the Lord's Prayer. Teacher would then give the older classes a quick resume of their work so he could start the beginners on their road to learning. Our classes were usually interesting, but if we found them boring, we would put our hand up and ask to leave the room. That was permission to go to the back house. We would dawdle as much as possible till we thought we missed the rest of the class. Of course, the teacher soon caught on to that as we were timed and had to stay after school, plus double time for dawdling. Usually writing a hundred lines pertaining to that subject was another punishment for us. When it came to potato picking time, how I wished we had the big fields of potatoes that the new settlers had. They were given time off from school to help their parents get the crops in. Our next big event we prepared for was Halloween. Our teacher would give us patterns for witches and goblins and black cats, and we would decorate our school windows and hang up black and orange streamers in the schoolroom. We were given the afternoon off to have a party. After Halloween, we were back at schoolwork preparing for exams, reviewing, studying, and given short tests. By the end of November, we started counting the days until Christmas. Our trustees would come over with the Eaton's catalog so we could pick out our gifts. We were allowed 50 cents per student for a gift. The teacher made up the list of what each child wanted. I remember asking for a sewing machine and my mom reprimanded me for asking for such an expensive gift. But you know what? I got it. The boys asked for slaves. They were worth 75 cents and they also got what they wanted. When I think of it now, T. Eaton Company was certainly special angels. To many families, that was the only gift they received at Christmas time. In practicing for our Christmas concert, Miss Edith Thompson, our outstanding music teacher for St. Andrews, I'm sorry, for Selkirk and District, gave generously of her time to teach us how to sing. She would say, don't forget to cross your T's. For example, in songs such as, Good King Wenceslas looked out T. Making sure that we sounded the T at the end of out. Miss Thompson also was a trustee for the Mapleton School Board for a number of years. While we were preparing our concert, our mothers were busy making candy bags out of red and green mesh bags with a drawstring of colored wool. In it would go a Japanese orange, candies and nuts for each child and a few extra for some little children that had not yet reached school age. When the big day arrived, we were given the day off to clean up. Curl our hair with rags or brown paper. The boys went to the neighbors for a haircut. Our dresses were usually bright red, green, or red plaid. Our shoes were black patent leather. The schoolroom looked like a fairyland. The big tree in the corner and our stage was put up by the trustees and covered with red or green crepe paper on the edges. It was trimmed with tinsel. Our parents were so proud of us. Santa Claus would come and give our presents from the school board. After the concert, out came the coffee and tea, sandwiches and cake. 
The floor was cleared and the young adults had the remainder of the evening for dancing. Many a married couple today had met at such gatherings. Christmas holidays were spent going down to the river bank to the most popular slide for bobsledding. They came from Selkirk, LeBeau, East Selkirk, and Goner to sled. The young men spent endless hours clearing the snowbanks and icing it up. We went at a terrific speed across the river and then curved and turned on the west bank back to the east side. To keep out of the wind and cold, the young men built igloos for us to wade in. Wow! The other sport was skiing with skis made with loving care by our fathers. The wood was sawed, planed, and steamed to curve, harnessed with homemade straps. January was usually a long, cold month, but it didn't bother us much. We hurried home, did our chores of carrying wood and water from the school well, feeding the chickens and the cows, etc. Then back down to the slide. In the summer, it was swimming in the old swimming hole by Summer Scales Mansion. How many young people today have such happy, clean pastimes as we had in our day? February was, of course, preparing for Valentine's Day. Our art class was making the most original Valentine cards for our friends and secret lovers. Then the week before the biggest box was made into hearts pasted on it. Then the week before the biggest box was made into the mu most beautiful Valentine box with cupids and hearts pasted on it. Then another party with pink cakes, heart cookies, and sandwiches, and lemonade. Down to work again, getting ready for Easter exams. Another holiday usually spent guessing when the ice would break up. We would climb on the huge pieces of ice back to school and not long before we were out for summer holidays. Some of the records pertaining to the Mapleton School were minutes of trustees meetings. <clears throat> Some of the members present in the, these meetings were Jay Spence, G.H. Townsend, R. McKenzie, B. Dickinson, T. Johnson, Mr. Smallman, E. Sinclair, an estimate of the expenditures for the year 1921 was a total of $2,105. And that includes paying the teachers and the caretakers and looking after the school. My, that certainly has changed. In 1926, meeting, it was moved by Mr. C. McKenzie, seconded by Ms. Spence, that $50 be donated out of the school funds for the purchase of a piano for school purposes. Soon as we approach our 100th anniversary, may we meet and reminisce of all the years gone by and hope and pray that the next 100 will be just as memorable. Mrs. Edith Thompson, a music teacher, came from the U.S. in the early years of Mapleton, Mapleton District and lived near the school. Her father kept bees, sold honey, and was caretaker of the school. Edith served as a school trustee for a time, taught music, piano, and violin in Selkirk, Winnipeg, and had pupils at her home. She played for Christmas concerts and social functions along with Manny uh, Houghton was part of Miss Potts Orchestra. Her love of music, dedication to her work, and fondness for people's lives on, lives on in the hearts and minds of her former pupils and the community in which she served so faithfully. So that was the story of the Mapleton School and that has changed 
a great degree because now it's a much bigger school and even has a gymnasium. A modern day school. So this story is called, You're Wondering, Perhaps. It's about St. Andrew's Community Club. We have a community club. So what, you say? But where would we meet and where would we play if not for this building of wood and concrete? with its light bulbs and buzzers and canteen with a treat. It's a gray, odd-shaped building, trimmed in white and pale blue, a few doors and one window, and la, and alas, people too. The wee young to the grand old, a variety of folk, come to skate and to dance and to share a good joke. You're wondering, perhaps, of the history the club led. Well, it started with one rink and a dilapidated shed. The ice flooding was done in the 40s by a bucket brigade from a hole in the solid river that someone had made. For official history, Nick Uzarts the key, he descriptively passed this info to me. A lengthy discussion of old times he'll delight, these events he confess confesses were always in sight. In the 50s and 60s, essential groundwork was laid by elections, a referendum, and a constitution was made. Physical improvements were needed, an idea was born, the land was purchased by four who got the bull by the horn. In 72, the executive started another ball rolling, not realizing how far their adventure was going. Through some grants, donations, borrowed wire and pipe, the clubhouse was built and the place took new life. A fine spot we now had to call bingos in rows, but oh, how the skaters would freeze their poor toes. In 75, an arena was sought by a group called the Board. Through petitions and hearings and some help from the Lord, they commissioned a committee to get underway by contracting and drawings and tendering one day. These guys were perfectionists, determined and bright. Through Persistence and long hours did the job right. This building committee was a crew made of men who were led by a Clegg. All know him as Glenn. He loved, he's loved and respected in the kingliest way. Ask a question of him and you'd better say may. His volunteers held the hammers pushed the dirt, knocked down the walls, built the rink, dug the holes, and made many phone calls. They wore out their shovels, pulled wires, broke backs, to the small hours of the morning laid tile and then wax. The ladies assisted in their own special way by pierogi and bake sales and canteen every day. Sometimes lonely, but patient, when their man got a call from the club a while later through the door he would fall. They designed a kitchen with a lounge in the back for a fireplace, some couches, a simple little shack. There's talk of a TV, a bar and a stool, a special massage table when the men lose their cool. The cost was a bundle, 200,000 and some change and our treasure Ed Starska kept in the range. Many nights went by sleepless in his busy household, 
planning meetings and schedules, writing checks, oh so bold. The sources of money had approached this undertaking with a confident face trying to keep the knees from shaking. He was able to inspire our people to make cash with a twinkle in his eye gave the threat of the lash. The grants from the feds and Manitoba government and bingo and lotteries and raising the rent were some of the ways the money was got. And remember the socials added to the pot. Zachara, Nudecki, Starska, Clegg and Dunlop signed notes to the bank so the work would not stop a generous thing for these fellows to do so the arena could happen for me and for you. Our Reeve and municipal councillors dedicated some loot, 150,000 and some gravel to boot. In the end, all our efforts would be fruitless, you see, without you dear people of the municipality. They sent trucks and machines to help the volunteer crowd and the results that they see must make them feel proud. To the Reeve, one of the greatest, a message in jest, you get the money and we'll do the rest. I purposely left this guy for the last, our past president, Sonny, who had a gavel made of cast. He directed, inspired a man with much brain, even his wife admits he was easy to train. He contributed much info to every committee. With confidence, I worked as his secretary. Many letters and minutes I read from the book for determined he was by hook or by crook. You're wondering perhaps what the volunteers are. They're a special breed of people whose motives go far. But why, you ask, what was the force? It's simple, the children, our greatest resource. Every part was important, no matter how big or how small. Like a puzzle you're making, the pieces, you need them all. We showed off this accomplishment to friend and to foe at our grand opening celebrations exactly one year ago. The combination of people was just meant to be like a scientific formula, perfect chemistry, led to this occasion, the burning of the mortgage and this party including the lunch and the corkage. It was all like some magic, no job left undone Every person involved is worth gold by the ton. A tribute to all in this friendliest way. Congratulations and thank you for this wonderful day. Now that was quite an undertaking for perhaps some, some of you's grandparents, your parents, because recreation and community clubs are very important to how we survive and what we get to do.